Yeah, because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm lucky if I can set the alarm right on the coffee pot. So, <laughs> All right, so let's start the live right now. Hey, guys, we are going live with uh, Corey Hawk and uh, Ray Fletcher. We're talking about how to make a bow in a survival situation. So we're going to cue our intro, and let's go from there. Awesome, guys. My name is Dr. Tan with the Survival Doctors. We interview experts in survival and survival medicine. And today we have Corey Hawk, ex-Marine or former U.S. Marine, uh, current hunter and uh, boyer, specializing in traditional longbows at organic archery. And we also have uh, Ray Fletcher, hunter, carpenter, loves to play in the woods. And he is uh, part of Riverbend Longbows, making traditional recurve bows. Welcome, guys to the show. What's up, everybody? Howdy. Hey, guys. So uh, our first topic question is, um, how do you guys, if you were walking the woods, uh, picking out um, a tree or just um, some resources, what would you bring to the team or what would you bring to um, the, the woods and what would you use to process down that wood? You want me to take this one real quick, Ray? Sure. I guess it would depend on what area you're in. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, for Corey, being in the Arctic not too long ago, there's not too many choices up there for making a bow. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, river banks, you know, you're going to want to find water. Willow is one of your mo most number one resources for a quick, fast survival Bushman bow. Mm -hmm. You can do anything with Willow in a pinch. I mean, if you're just talking about surviving... You know, you're not going to find the perfect seasoned Osage out there in the wild. You know, you could find, you know, burned or blow downs are best to make a bow out of because they're already kind of preset seasoned. And uh, what do you think, Corey? Yeah, I think uh, a will is a good option for a survival bow. I mean, you might be able to make a, a low hunting weight poundage bow for that. And you're going to have the cordage on the inner bark right there. Right. So you can kind of do it all yep. in one stop. But uh it's really, like Ray said, going to be dependent on everybody's region. There wasn't much in the Arctic other than birch, and that's uh, mm -hmm. so-so at best. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, I always try to tell people just to go in your backyard, familiarize yourself with your trees, and uh, probably your best bet for early success is going to be a local hardwood that either grows a nut, a fruit, or a berry. So like right. your oak trees, your you know apples, cherries, hackberries, stuff like that. Walnut. Um, Walnut's a great one. Yeah, well, that's great. That's, that's cool. awesome. So, so that's a pretty good place to start. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a really amazing tip. And um, I've never heard that before. So a nut, a berry or a fruit, you said? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A hardwood that produces one of those three is, is, I mean, there's a pretty good chance that you'll be able to make a mm -hmm. functional weapon out of it. Yeah. And, and uh, out of curiosity, when you're looking at these hardwoods, is it most hardwoods would work similarly? Or is there something about those particular trees that bear fruit, bear nuts? And um, well, what kind of, what makes those specific hardwoods better for bows? Uh, really, it comes down to tension and compression properties of the wood. So uh, if you have a bow that's weak in tension, it's almost mm -hmm. going to be impossible to make a bow out of it um, without some sort of backing. So that's just going to add an extra step. It's going to mm -hmm. add some sort of binding agent to the, to the mix. So if you've got a hardwood that's naturally very strong in tension, but maybe mm -hmm. a little bit weaker in compression, uh, you might get a bow that doesn't, it doesn't perform as good as a bow that's good in both compression and tension, like Osage or you or something like that. But at least it'll be strong enough in tension that even if you make a few minor errors, you're likely to get a, a bow that survives and shoots out of it. Right. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because uh, there was one guy, let me pull up this question over here. He, he asked, is Osage a, an actually a, a good wood or was it something that uh, the indigenous people kind of messed with uh, the people coming over here? So can you, can you guys uh, comment on what your personal experience with Osage uh, has been to date? Oh, if, if you get a good piece and you can work a stick out of it, it's bulletproof wood. I mean, you can get a bow that'll last years out of Osage. That's for sure. 
That's awesome. But it's quite a process, isn't it, Corey, with Osage? It's... Yeah, Osage is going to always add to the complexity, but uh, with, <laughs> like, you know, seasoning it properly because it shrinks very badly and, and tends to crack. So you got to season mm -hmm. it properly, and then you've got to chase a ring, and uh, it's just a lot of extra steps compared to just, like, a white hardwood bow. But yep. uh, there's, it's earned the reputation of uh, King of the Bow Woods for a reason. I mean, if you, if you have a well-executed Osage bow, I would, uh, I'd be confident in saying it'll outperform just about any other wood out there. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting that you said uh, mentioning to like season the bow. What does that mean for people who may not know? Uh, yeah, seasoning is just the process of letting the wood get down to the proper internal moisture content which is usually around 10 percent um and to cure out slowly yeah 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 because if you force dry it um there's a lot more shrinkage and potential to crack and damage the stave or to warp the wood so ideally um if you're going to craft a bow that you want to you it'll know hand it'll split <laughs> oh oh nice yeah. <laughs> is that an osage piece oh Oh, we... Ray, Ray, are you still there? <laughs> so, still awesome. Um, so, so, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, ideally, you want to let it season slowly. But mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the big differences with the white wood bows, too, is you can actually force dry them, and they're mm -hmm. less likely to split. So the chances of, like, making a successful bow in a pinch out of white wood is far mm -hmm. greater mm -hmm. than it is with Osage. And when you say and back white... To, like, back to the like the willow bow as far as a quick survival bow you can heat harden that over the fire hmm. <laughs> when you start with greenwood though like that in a pinch you have to strip the bark and just put it away for the night and just let it slowly and you have to keep that out of the sun throughout the whole building hmm. process and then you can heat harden that and you can recurve the tips on it and everything with heat and you can actually get a pretty good bow out of in alder, actually, if you can find a straight piece of alder, mm -hmm. which is rare, but <laughs> it's a good, you know, improvised, you know, bow if you had to in a survival situation, that's for sure. At our, uh, Elm, have you ever worked with Elm, Corey? Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been doing some work with the local Elms here and um, with the bows that, that I've made tricky. out of it. Yeah, it seems like they're, they're a little bit stringy. Yeah, and a little bit weak in compression too. It seemed to take mm -hmm. a lot of string follow, but it does make a good bow. And I mm -hmm. wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't hesitate to shoot large game with it, even if it takes a little bit of yeah. string follow. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, can you um, kind of clarify some of the terms that you're using for people who might not uh, be familiar with that? Uh, when I say string follow, I just mean that the wood has been so stressed during the making process that it mm -hmm. essentially stays bent after oh. you unstring it so um i mean in in the the professional bowyer's world uh, a bow with less string <clears throat> follow is generally considered to be more well executed and a little better performing but the mm -hmm. trade-off that you do get when a uh, bow takes a little bit of string follow or permanent set they both sort of mean the same thing um you're going to get a much quieter bow with a little bit more forgiving shooting characteristics it just won't have quite the the speed of cast of a bow that didn't take any at all Right on, right on. So we kind of um, are walking through the woods. We find like um, a few di different tree options. What are is on your belt? What do you have in your pack to kind of process th that down? I mean, there have uh, there are plenty of videos online, and uh, a lot of people have great success just making it with a large bush knife. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can uh, you can craft a bow from start to finish with a hatchet if you really want to get crazy with it but uh yeah. i would say definitely a way to fell the tree whether that's a folding saw <laughs> or an axe is going to come in handy and mm -hmm. then uh oh this is another thing that we could touch on too when you're when you're first looking for trees you don't have to build a bow out of a huge you know 18 inch tree that you've got to split into into bow yeah. staves with with a hammer and wedges you can yep ray's got a, just a nice little three four inch yep. diameter sapling mm -hmm. and, and once and the bark's make, down a two inch rock and roll yep. Then you can just right take on. your hatchet and shape the limb profiles and uh, use your pocket knife to tiller it out. And then what you want to do is, once you find your stave that you want to make it out of, is find the natural bend. And what you do is you put your left or right hand in with the butt end down in the ground. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of see me? Yeah, I can see you. And when you push, 
the bow will twirl to its natural bend and the outside bend will then become your back of the bow. And you want to stay with that natural bend if you're doing a survival bow like that. And that, that way you're not fighting the elements that's already got the natural bend of the bow and just mark center and start working the belly, the inside of the bow. Now this is a fiberglass bow, but, mm -hmm. and then you'll want to start, you know, slowly working that belly out to the tips on each end till you get a nice even tiller, but you don't want to string it up and try to pull it back until you're completely almost done because you could ruin the whole thing right off the bat. It takes a lot of patience and practice in a real survival situation. You know, you're better off to really make a rabbit stick or an atlatl and then work on your bow around the campfire at night and take mm -hmm. your time with it. You know, set your snares, your fishing nets, whatever. Make an atlatl. If you have game in your area, you can knock an atlatl out in 10 minutes, you know. Oh, yeah. That's and then awesome. save your time around camp. I mean, if you're really in a survival situation, yeah, work on your bow. Work on your bow at night when you're not doing anything around the campfire. Mm -hmm. make your cordage nice, you know, take your time. That's the, the tool you're going to really want to rely on in the upcoming weeks or months. If you know, you're not going to back out in a while and, you know, make the land work for you instead of fighting it. That's the main thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you guys, what would you, uh, kind of consider for a bowstring? Um, is paracord a good bowstring? Is it too much of a, a laxity after repetitive use? Or what would you use? Paracord's great for survival. Yeah. You bet. That's yeah, dead on a bowstring. <laughs> it's not given. <laughs> yeah, it'll it'll stretch a little bit in the beginning because it is a typically nylon. But once you get all the stretch out of it, it'll make a serviceable one for a survival situation, no doubt. Or even yep. you could even do a, like a bundled up uh, reverse twist bank line like a tarred mm -hmm. bank line, any sort of nylon, nylon cordage, which most survivalists always have on them. Yeah. And uh, one question we had um, is how about using like animal parts for uh, bowstring? How does, what, what parts of the animal would you use? You can use well, definitely uh, this. Go, go ahead, Rick. Oh, I was going to say, you can use strips of rawhide. Uh, you can use the animal's sinew. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I mean, there's natural cordage as well. I've made plenty of uh, successful bowstrings from the local uh, nettles, like just nettle fibers. Mm -hmm. Oh, no up. way. Yeah, um, nettles, nettles makes a nice strong bowstring. Same with yucca. Oh, you yeah. just got to know, <laughs> you just got to know which plants in your area um, yep. are best suited for it. But hide and sinew makes a fine bowstring. Mm. Intestines. Intestines, oh, yeah. too. It's yeah. really gross, but it makes a great bowstring. <laughs> <laughs> and... For the intestines, how long do you think uh, you wait till it like dries after you kind of wrap it up and braid it? I've never uh, from, done it. <laughs> but go yeah, ahead. I've never made one out of guts, but uh, I, I've he heard that with any sort of uh, natural bowstring, the, the method's pretty much the same. You reverse wrap the cordage, try to get your uh, bowstring as even and uniform as possible, and then you're going to want to hang some weight off of it and let it let it dry in the stretched position. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. So if you could uh, somehow fashion, like fashion a heavy rock to it and uh, attach the other end to a tree and let it hang overnight until it dries out, that'd be ideal. And then if you still have the carcass or whatever you're working with, use the animal fat to help lube the string up to give it more uh, elasticity. Mm -hmm. Same with natural cordage. You know, if you have natural cordage like a nettle, cor nettle, uh, nettle bowstring, if you have access to wax, you know, or bear fat or fat or whatever animal you're dealing with, mm -hmm. you work that in there. The same with your bow, you know, when you're doing a survival bow, if you have access to animal fat or fish, if you're catching fish while you're working on your bow, mm -hmm. boil all the fish skins up, keep your fish skins, boil it up, separate the fish oil on, and then you're going to want to rub that into your bow when it's dried and cured. And that'll help the elasticity of the fibers of the bow and it won't draw in moisture in odd spots and get some weird warpage here or there. It'll help seal that bow. It won't waterproof it, of course, but it'll help seal it and keep that cured locked position. And you want to do that often. You know, same with your bowstring. Just keep everything nice and fresh. Mm -hmm. 
And more so than likely, you're going to be catching fish, maybe, mm -hmm. wherever you're at. Or you can make fish glue out of it if you want to back your bow with some rawhide, you know, or break down bones and boil it and make a protein, you know, glue. So how's the process for that? I, I think I've seen it done with like hoofs and stuff like that, but uh, um, can you kind of describe the, the process for some of our viewers? Basically you just, I think the hoof part, I've never done the hoof thing, but I think you just kind of crush it up, boil it down really good and it'll start separating those proteins and it's quite a process, what I gather. I've always wanted to try it. I have boiled fish, though, before and got all the oil. And that's pretty simple. And it makes a really good glue, actually, too. You can make a good glue out of it. Hmm. I didn't know that. So how much water are you adding to this uh, mixture when you're doing, like, um, you're, you're saying just the the fish bones? Or are you saying also the, the skins and all that? I've just done the fish skins before to get the oil mm -hmm. and... Uh, I don't know. More stuff for us to play around with, I guess. Yeah. I haven't really. Yeah. I'm sure it'll be yep. out. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't do any sort of backings on my bows at all, so I don't have any reason for. I know a lot of guys like to do uh, natural glues with natural materials, so mm -hmm. fish glues or hide glues if they're using raw hide or snake skins. But uh, yep. yeah, since I don't back glue. my bows, I've really had no reason to experiment with glues other than pine pitch for securing arrow points and things. Yeah. Right on. I mean, there's great information out there. Ryan Gill, that guy, mm -hmm. he's, if you want to know information about real hunt primitive stuff, that's for sure one guy to check out. Ryan he Gill. Know, yeah, he knows his stuff. Right on. We have a question here from, I think it might be one of your followers, uh, Wood Pigeon Outdoors. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, so red cedars are often used for bows. Uh, how about white cedars? Are there any difference in the reds and whites? Mm hmm. I, I generally try to steer people away from cedar if they can, because it's, uh, it's an extreme critical wood and it's kind of weak in tension. So if you want a successful uh, cedar bow that's going to last a long time, you definitely need to back it. And also they're just, uh, they're kind of, they have a reputation for just violently exploding for no yeah. reason at all. <laughs> even after, even after many hundreds of shots or even years after service, they'll just yeah. let go for no reason. Dang, it's, usually, I, it's usually quite violent. It sends wood shards yeah. everywhere, and it can. I was at a shoot, at a primitive shoot years ago, and the guy in front of us, his just exploded. <laughs> One guy had a Dang. chunk in his cheek, you know. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, I've I've heard stories of people getting hurt bad by cedar or sending a piece through their wall or through their roof of their shop. Yeah. So I, Jeez. I, just, yeah. I just stay away from it. That's crazy. Yeah. You've probably got something in your area that'll work better than cedar, so. Just take How, a look, look around for those hardwoods. In my area, I have maple. I'm not sure if that's necessarily a hardwood, but I think that's one of the harder woods that I have in the area. I think I do have a little bit of oak here as well, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, the oak trees we have here, I'd have to do a little bit of climbing to get to some of the limbs. <laughs> yeah, your, uh, your maples are going to make a good bow. Um, there's only one. Most of them will make a fine bow, just like any sort of other white wood, but... Uh, the only one that's a little bit so-so is like a silver ma maple or a creek maple. That's okay. going to be a lot. That'll perform a lot like a willow. It'll be very light yeah, and they're real soft and brittle. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And we, we did have a question over here. Um, should you only use the heartwood when you're processing this down? No, no definitely not. Um, so with uh, with any sort of hardwood tree. What do you got there, Ray? I was just going to show them what you're talking about, chasing the ring. Okay. You know. You know. Yeah. So you can kind of. Why see is that on... not in the camera? There we go. <laughs> can you see the hey. different grains? Am I showing it right? There we go. The different. But like he was saying earlier, there. yeah, the annual growth rings, and you find the back of your bow. Here's the thicker part. Man, this is really. And when you take off that outer layer, you'll get down to like the uh, cambion. Mm -hmm. And then once you get through that cambion, if you can find a nice ring to chase, that's the way he's saying you want to stay right on top of that ring, the whole back of that bow and not go through it. And uh, I'm sure. Well, yeah, go ahead. I was, I was just going to say with, uh, with any sort of, of hardwood bow, you're, you're generally not going to have to chase a ring at all. The sapwood directly under the bark is going to be the back of your bow. 
Yeah. So that's kind of what we were talking about earlier when I said that Os we were saying that Osage uh, adds levels of complexity to the build yeah. because you've got to chase a ring like Ray's saying, which is remove wood. Typically, I mean, you can make an Osage bow with sap wood on it, but uh, mm -hmm. it's it's always just best to take it off because the sap wood shrinks so so radically that it'll almost always crack out. So yep. you got to chase down into the heartwood and like Ray said, follow one continuous growth ring throughout the whole length of the bow. And uh, that's just another reason why um, the hardwoods, the, just the white hardwoods that you have in the back of your yard are, are typically superior to Osage in a, hmm. in a pinch. Do you want to and explain when, to them too, Corey, about when you come to like, if you have a tree limb or not, how to work around that just a little bit? Yeah, that, that's so, like a huge problem. Because a that, lot of uh, people just go yeah. right over it and your bow's gone. Yeah, so anytime, so the grain of a tree is going to flow a lot like a river around obstacles. So if the tree has a knot, um, the grain is going to kind of just go around the knot and then resume its natural course. And it's also going to raise the wood up. So you'll typically have like a, a peak anywhere that there's an imperfection or a, or a limb or an abnormality. So you have to be very careful to leave a little bit of extra wood around any of your abnormalities while you're chasing a ring. And then you can come back later and delicately, delicately peel away uh, the wood from the knots and things with a pocket knife or, or a little bit of a finer tool. It's just like because, if you had a piece of material and you pushed it up, you know, that's part of the skin steel. Mm -hmm. If you took that off, then you've got a weak spot in your, you know, same, same concept where he's saying you yeah. just want to heal up to it and just kind of, work around the mountain. And then do you keep that um, even at the end, that little raise amount? Definitely. That's yeah, a, a lot of people- Character. <laughs> character for sure. Uh, a lot of people always ask, you know, does the character affect the integrity of the bow? And I always tell them, it doesn't affect the integrity of the bow at all unless you violate the rings on the character. So that's what Ray's saying. I mean, every imperfection pushes the grain up. And then, so if you cut it off flat, you know, you could take off one, two, three, Right. Or, you know, several growth rings just from trying to make that imperfection look or look flat. Yeah. And that's so, where it's going to blow. Man, that's such a good tip. Because uh, that, that, when, when I was going through like a lot of maples, it's just that like little bump and you're just going right through it. And I had no idea it affects the integrity that much. So thank you guys. Mm -hmm. And that's where you just want to carefully take a scraper, the back of your knife, especially if you got like a good bush knife the 90 degree part of your back of your knife and just kind of just nicely work your way around it slow and easy. Right on. And back to scrapers, you know, as far as making one in the survival bow, you go down to the riverbed, just start busting rocks up until you get shards, you know, mm -hmm. and then you got, got a perfect, there. perfect scraper, you know, nice. It don't take and much. They what kind of rock? A new one. What kind of rock was that? What kind of rocks do you have in your areas? Oh, we've got just about everything. I don't know. Jasper, quartz, um, slate, mm -hmm. you know, the usual mixed bag. Of course, we're in a glacier, glacial area, you know, Iowa, and so is Omaha, I believe. Yeah. And so it's a real mixed bag. We don't have any real good flint. You know, mm -hmm. like good flint here is just all ground up in the glacial, you know, glaciers. So if we do have it, it's real conglomerate and hard, not real good flaking material for arrowheads. But, you know, you've got, uh, you know, that, which is just basically, um, right, what is that called? Lime, like a limestone chert. Mm -hmm. You can make really nice points out of that. And making a, back to the survival thing you know people think you're going to have to make some perfectly good arrows that's not going to happen usually where you're at but if you're on a river bank you have mm -hmm. access to most likely reed mm. fragmite grass and you can make quick easy arrows out of this all night sitting around the fire as many as you want and if you're hunting small game on your tip just go find a round stone, place it there, wrap a piece of cordage around it, and wrap it up nice and tight. You don't have to fletch it because you're probably going to be within seven yards. And that mm -hmm. FOC of that stone is just going to drive right home. I mean, you're not going to go and shoot these through paper to make sure you're getting the right FOC. 
if you're surviving. <laughs> so, awesome. and even uh, Moline, you know, like you use for hand drill fires, mm -hmm. excellent, excellent, quick, easy arrows. They're very tough. So if you find these nice and dried out, and you just scrape off all the nodules nice, mm -hmm. there you go, rock and roll. Yeah. Yeah, the arrows are definitely going to be the hardest thing to that, get right out there. Advanced right there. Yeah. So those are some uh, arrows that you can kind of just snatch snatch away. Um, do you ever um, look at straight saplings, dry them out, and then uh, slowly over time work work them in? For arrows, you mean? Yep, for arrows. Yeah, willow. Once again, back to willow. Willow sapling straights make great ones. You can heat bend those over fire nice. I mean, just dead on and heat cure them right there green yeah. you know while they're still green they make great shafts i've you had good luck with the uh, with willow and uh basswood shoots and mm -hmm. hazel shoots so a lot Dog of times you, yeah or uh, any of the uh of the the dogwoods mm -hmm. yeah yep. so you just got to kind of explore the explore the shorter shrubbier plants you know that that don't reach way up into the canopy and you're you'll probably find something yeah that uh you can make a suitable arrow with but it's going to take work and you got to force dry it because you can't mm. you can't shoot a green arrow they're just about worthless yeah <laughs> too heavy Back, right like the they're frag just too, might... too, too flimsy yeah the frag might grass if you can you want to find them that are already dead or dried you know in that situation mm-hmm and then above each nodule, man, why can't I find that? I'm like looking in a mirror here. You want to cut it at least three quarter of an inch above the nodule and then make like a hardwood insert mm. so it won't blow out. And then you can carve your little knock or whatever. And they'll last a lot longer that way. So you have your more, most of your strength and you'll take some cordage and wrap that nice and tight around your knock or whatever. You know, the information's out there, and just part of it's just getting out there and doing it, learning Absolutely. it, getting yeah. your hands where your hands can feel through it. Just yeah, experience. You, uh, go out there and experiment because you're going to be surprised how difficult it is to, to make a bow that doesn't collapse under a, a hinge, which is, a, you know, a, a spot that you've created in the limbs that are too weak. So it might take you you know, three or four or five dry run, or I mean, practice runs to get yourself a functional bow that'll actually shoot right. more than a couple shots without failing. So don't, you, a bow is definitely not a last <laughs> resort survival thing. Oh, yeah. Go into totally green with no, uh, you know, no prior attempts. So if you're interested yeah, if, in making survival bows, definitely get out there and practice. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Corey, I, I know earlier this year you were talking about a chorus. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, um, Kind of, kind of your future plans to teach this? So, I mean, I had to plan originally to start inviting people into my workshop in 2020 for some either one-on-one -on -one coaching or, you know, classes up to maybe three or four people uh, just to kind of step them through their first bow build and uh, give them one-on-one -on -one instruction and uh, sort of just oversee the build from start to finish. And uh, the idea was to have a three or a four-day class where, you know, you come into my shop and uh, we start from a a stave from scratch and uh, you walk out of here with a shooting weapon and we'd, we'd go over string making and uh, maybe if there's enough time at the end of the class, throw in a couple arrows there. But, uh, you know, the pandemic kind of threw everything off. So we're, oh, looking yeah, big at, time. Uh, we're looking at hopefully 2021 uh, opening up some organic archery bow building classes here in Nebraska. So organic archery, is that going to be um, um, the website right here? Is that, uh, would they be able to get that course uh, if they go to your uh, website at www.organicarchery.com? Yep, that's perfect. Uh, right as, soon as, the, as soon as everything's cleared to go for these courses and uh, we get the logistics worked out, there will be a link for, for courses on the website, a, a totally separate page for it. So Great. It's really cool. And then we had, um, I think one of our uh, followers for this live just got on not too long ago. Uh, he was mentioning, um, let's see. I understand that Osage is a great bow or a bow making material, uh, but in Canada, uh, what would you recommend? I, th I think we went through uh, a lot of this uh, at the very beginning, looking for trees that have uh, like nuts, fruits, and then also um, uh, willow I heard was uh, really good. And then you also said maple is decent. And we do have a lot of maple in Canada. So um, is there anything else uh, you can add? 
Yeah, it's really going to depend on which uh, which region of Canada he's in. If he's on the east, you know, if he's on the southeast portion of it, there's a chance that he'll have some of those hardwoods from, uh, you know, like the New York region. So he should have maples and things like that. Um, I think he's, he's in Alberta. Alberta. Okay. I think so. Or somewhere up there. And then you've got uh, you've got Pacific U. That's going to be another that's going to be another like premium quality top notch bow wood. <laughs> Probably the you know the the direct competition of Osage as far as best bow woods. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, Birch Birch makes a decent one. You should be able to get a 40, 45 pound hunting bow out of that. Mm -hmm. um, just have to experiment. And all are all birches are the same because the first uh, bow that I tried to make myself was out of a yellow birch. And I think I did exactly what you told us not to do. And I went over a lot of those nodules and it just like after a day of just carving it down, first string just snaps and whacks me in the forehead. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. yellow birch is much softer than a silver birch, I think. Or a white birch. Yeah. And it doesn't, I mean, no matter which birch you choose, it's going to be probably so brittle in tension that if you violate those imperfections like, like yeah. you did, then there's, there's little to no chance of it surviving. So mm -hmm. it's yeah. going to take a, a meticulous execution on those softer woods. <laughs> Vanessa saying, um, can you use pecan trees? Sure. Not, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Pecan trees make, <laughs> uh, they make excellent bows. Yeah. Really? That's cool. That's cool. And uh, one of the questions that we had uh, earlier was, um, how wide do you need to start? And uh, Ray, I think, yeah, you mentioned uh, about like wrist, wrist wide. You can find like a sapling or something like that. Is that right? In a, survi in a survival situation, yes. Mm -hmm. How about in an ideal situation where you have your shop, you, you're kind of going through uh, the forest and kind of selecting something that you want to keep for a while? Yeah, ideally you're going to choose a tree that's, you know, big enough around in diameter that by the time you quarter it out into bow staves or split it out into, you know, eight or ten different bow staves, the, the circumference of the tree is going to give you as close to a flat back as you possibly can. Yeah. So larger diameter trees that are quartered out are, are ideal. But uh, so a sapling is going to have what's called a high crown, so it's going to look kind of rounded on the back. And uh, that's fine, and it'll make a good performing bow. Mm -hmm. It'll just it'll just place a lot of pressure on the very highest portion of the crown. So there's less wood that's able to take the tension forces, and it'll mm -hmm. just never perform quite as well as a bow that's got you know a little yeah. bit more evenly distributed stress. Right on. And uh, when you're quartering it out, are you uh, kind of removing some of that outer layer rings when you're uh, taking taking it? Is it the the most pr preferred uh, pieces like closer to the middle, or how does that work? I, I would say no, not necessarily. No. Um, like if this was a log, what he's saying is he'll take that natural crack and split it, you know, up and then you'll find mm -hmm. another one. And so basically, you know, you're imagining a 10 to 12 inch round. And so he's getting four quarters out of that. So there's pie shapes. Mm -hmm. And so then he's wanting to look for the flattest part for that to be the, the back of your bow, which is facing away from you. Yeah, right. if it were if it were a slice of pizza, the crust of the pizza is going to become the back of your bow as you're there looking you at a bow stave that's been taken out of a log. Right on. Yep. And uh, one interesting question we had uh, on Instagram was, uh, does your wood choice change depending on the time of year? Yes. Um, as far as crafting, or you know, we'll just go into crafting. Um, yeah, let's do it. If, so if you're if you are crafting uh, from from scratch out in a survival situation in the spring through the late summer months, you're going to want to go for those, those hard white wood trees mm -hmm. because they're going to have a really high sap content at that time. And you'll be able to just cut, cut down the sapling or cut down the tree and pull the bark off in one big sheet. And mm -hmm. it'll, it'll just come off like a sock basically. And then you'll have your pristine bow back already exposed. Mm. And, and they yeah. shrink a lot less than Osage, so there's a, there's a much less chance of the back cracking on you. So, I mean, you just let it dry out for a little while, and, and uh, that bow's ready to go. But, and uh, as, as boyers, we should have been stashing away ash 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because of the ash yeah. borers, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, what happened? No more ash. No more well, ash. We're not going to have ash trees anymore. And they what make happened? great bows. The emerald boring a, beetle. 
Mm. Yeah, the Emerald Beetle situation going on right now. So I, I definitely try to stay away from Ash just for the sake yeah. of conservation. Main, yeah. yeah. But uh, real quick to tie up that last question. Uh, if you harvest Osage wood in the summertime when the sap content's really high you're, mm. and you pull that bark off like one big sheet, it's going to crack beyond repair. I mean, that, that bow will split up with huge, huge splits in it that go all the way down into heartwood and you'll never be able to save it. But uh, if you harvest Osage in the wintertime and let it, let it dry out for a while with the bark on, uh, then, then you're good to go. Mm -hmm. So Osage in the wintertime, white hardwoods in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And when you said uh, for the white hardwoods uh, in the springtime, you take off that um, outer bark and uh, drying it for a little while. How do you know when it's dry enough to kind of work on it? As soon as it's dry enough to, uh, I mean, we're talking survival situation here, not ideal. Mm -hmm. As soon as the sap is dry enough for you to be able to, you know, mark on it with something, because it's going to be probably, it's going to be at least 24 hours before it's dry enough for even yeah. charcoal or a pencil to take on it. It's just going to be really slimy and wet for mm -hmm. a, a few hours that's what i was saying earlier is you get the bark off and just put it away for a day yeah. you know in the in the shade mm -hmm. yeah yeah if you lay it in the sun like ray was saying earlier it, it, you'll ruin Correct. it it doesn't matter yeah, what what species it is you definitely need it it's going to lose moisture very quickly in that first 24 to 48 hours mm -hmm. so awesome. i've heard of some i've as... heard of some guys would bury them in the sand and just cover <laughs> them up and let it slowly which nice. makes sense. Yeah, it's yeah. a great idea. And um, in ideal situations, um, how would you kind of uh, dry it out and know when it's um, ready to be worked on? You put it up in your attic for two years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's ideal. Uh, that's ideal. <laughs> yeah. But uh, really, it's going to be, you're just going to be kind of winging it out there in the woods. It's going to depend on the time of year. Uh, in the summertime, especially in the Midwest here where the humidity is, real bad it's going to be it's going to be hard to dry out uh yeah. a bow stave in the summertime so mm -hmm. uh, you can speed dry it you, you definitely don't want to speed dry it for the first couple of days like we were talking about let, let it do that rapid moisture loss start roughing out your profile as soon as you you know draw the profile of the bow on there start getting it to rough dimensions about the time it's dry enough for you to make marks on it mm -hmm. and then uh by that time because it'll probably take you a day or two to craft the profile of the bow you'll be able to start force drying it over the fire slowly and you can uh, do you know three or four long um three or four long heat treating sessions over the coals and it'll probably be pretty dry and when you say yeah. heat sessions over the coals what does that mean you're force drying the bow over hot coals basically, like, do you just, or do you just the drop it on it or no definitely <laughs> not <laughs> you want to keep it slowly slow just and yeah, gentle just... Yeah. Okay. And you, you and really want to try to only heat the belly of the bow as well. Okay. Like, like you can yeah. you just don't, don't get the back of the bow too hot to touch or, or you can yeah. uh, compromise the, the tension integrity. One thing to but, do towards the end of where you're starting to feel confident that you're done with the tillering and everything is to burnish the grain. Good. Do you, do you do burnishing? Uh, I don't do any burnishing on, on mine, but I would if I didn't have sealer because that's going to Yeah, in a survival situation and you don't have a way of sealing it, take a smooth river stone, you know, mm -hmm. find a smooth river stone and you just press as hard as you can and burnish that grain so it'll seal and press those mm. fibers back together so you don't have loose hairs that could actually end up being a fracture or a split. You know what I'm saying? You want to kind of push that grain down and you just... And it'll start getting shiny. I mean, it'll burnish like a polished wood. And do you do that on uh, the both the back and the belly, or do you do it on one side or the other? Both. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can burnish the entire bow uh, once yeah. you're finished. We got a just helps seal it. Awesome. We got a question here from Jerry. How do you like hickory as a wood choice? It's fantastic. Just try to try to keep it as dry as you can. Uh, yeah. They're 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 pretty much indestructible. Uh, yeah. I, if you have hickory in your area, start with that. It's going to be a quality bow wood. Uh, you might have a little trouble keeping it dry, but uh, it, it'll be your highest chance of early success because you can make a lot of mistakes with hickory and still get a shooting yeah. bow. Right on. Okay. And great, um, great tool wood, that's for sure. Yeah. 
One question we had here, how do you increase the longevity of your longbow? Don't let anybody say, else shoot it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, if you have a bow that you really love a lot and it's, uh, it's made out of all wood, uh, Ray's got a good point. Don't let any of your friends shoot it, especially <laughs> if it's unsupervised because people do crazy stuff with bows and uh, uh, I've, I've seen people break other people's bows. So it just, if a bow is crafted specifically for you and you really cherish it, that's your bow. Mm -hmm. yeah, I always, I always yeah. make a joke that... Uh, if you uh, if you ask to shoot another man's bow, it's kind of like asking to sleep with his wife. <laughs> like you just you just don't do it. That bow is yours. Uh, try to keep it out of. Try not to get it too hot at any time uh, mm -hmm. when it's strung up. So you know if you got your bow strung, don't go lay it out in the grass in a hot summer day, right in the direct sunlight, or you know you'll you'll decrease the performance. Ahead, That's Rick. another thing we didn't talk about is, especially with a self bow or survival bow, you'll want to keep that thing unstrung all the time unless you're going to use it. And a good thing to do, too, is slowly warm up the limbs before you go into a shooting situation to help help limber up those limbs and get those, the, the fibers heated up, mm -hmm. especially in a cold yeah. environment. You'd blow that thing up in a heartbeat. Possibly. Yeah, give uh, Ray touched on a good point. Uh, I always tell people if you're hunting, if you're working, your bow can be working. You know, if you're hunting and you're on your feet, you can have your bow strung up all day long if you're out in the field. But uh, mm -hmm. if you're resting, give your bow a rest. Just get in the habit. It's super fast. Do your step through method, whatever your preferred stringing method is, and pop that string off every time you sit down for a break and mm -hmm. or, or when you uh, get ready to go to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. They're unlike, you know, I build the fiberglass long bows. You know, I can keep these strung up all the time in a climatic, you know, climate controlled area that won't hurt those because they're, they're always going to be that shape no matter what. Mm -hmm. But unless you're, you know, definitely hauling it in a hot car or something, yeah, it'll delaminate you, bet you. But yeah, that's but a, the self bows the, for sure. You definitely have to. Yeah. Just try not to get them too hot. Mm -hmm. So don't let them sit in a hot car with the windows up. Don't let them sit in the direct sunlight on yeah. a summer day. <laughs> The heat Bad is going to cause catastrophic failure. You know, mm -hmm. the moisture and everything that, that, that might decrease your performance a little bit, but it, but it's not a, it's not a, you know, a situation that's going to yeah. break your bow or anything. And then for the kind of the opposite of that, uh, for people who don't know already, uh, Corey, you've been on the TV show alone, which is a survival show and your season, uh, season seven, you were in the Arctic. What kind of uh, bow did you bring? Did you make your own bow, go there and what kind of uh, modifications and maybe behavior and bow care did you do while you were out there? Yeah, so uh, I took uh, I took a Hackberry longbow to the Arctic that pulled about 52 pounds at my draw length. And um, the reason I chose Hackberry is because, and in, high, in hindsight, it was uh, the wrong choice because I kind of thought to myself without looking it up, which was foolish, that uh, I thought Northern Canada would have low humidity and whitewoods perform really well in low humidity. So I took my hackberry bow up there and uh, it turns out the humidity is uh, crazy high. Like uh, I'm, I'm just uh, spitballing here, but I believe it's above 80% in the winter time. Wow. So um, yeah. my bow took a ton of string follow. It didn't, it didn't hurt anything. Like the performance was fine. And uh, I, I wouldn't have hesitated to shoot any of the animals up there with it. But in hindsight, I think I would have liked to have a wood that was a little more um, resistant to, to extreme humidity like Osage. And then uh, Ray, oh, go ahead, Ray. Rick Spicer just got an elk with one of your bows this year, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he did. He, yeah, that's uh, cool. He took a, a nice bull this year uh, with uh, 50, I think the, the bow pulls about 53 pounds or 50, no, 56 pounds at his draw length, somewhere in there. Wow. Yeah. So that's it, was, a, it cool. was an Osage bow that I built for him about two years ago. That's awesome. It's funny that you mentioned it because one of our questions, um, one of our viewers asked, what is your most memorable bow hunt for both of you guys? Mm, I've got a good um, one. Ray, go you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> I've been uh, chasing this buck for several weeks and every time I got in my stand, he would use this other trail. So one morning I came home and I decided I'm making a homemade ghillie suit. My wife thought I was crazy and I was stripping up burlap and pinning it all over my camos. Next morning I went in and hit the trail that he had been following or using 
and I just sat down right on the side of the trail. It wasn't 20 minutes later here. He was tending this doe about a hundred yards out and then he was going like crap. He's, he's gone. So I was sitting there <laughs> 15 minutes later, here he come bat, 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 right at me. That doe was coming straight at me and I just curled in my shoulder. She jumped over me and he's right four yards away and I had to yell at him and he stopped broadside and just smoked him. It was so awesome. <laughs> nice. Greatest hunt ever. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Mine was, uh, mine was definitely, uh, the elk hunt that I went on in Idaho this September. Uh, I, and I wasn't even behind the bowstring. I, I didn't end up killing uh, two grouse while I was up there, two dusky grouse. That's just cool. kind of on, yeah. 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 On the way back, uh, to and from the camp to to pack out the meat from the top of the hill but uh yeah we went out into idaho um i was with rick spicer and uh robert tongue a couple of my friends uh ray's familiar with rick and uh we just uh rick did a bunch of map research we ended up uh going way back into a remote area that was pretty far from anybody else and uh we walked about four and a half miles back from the truck stayed up near this out al this alpine lake just below the tree line and uh, there was tons of game sign everywhere uh we ran into some mule deer but uh, wasn't able to, to close in and make a shot mm -hmm. stayed up at this camp uh just below the tree line for a few days and uh rick ends up smoking a, a huge bull double lung shot with that osage bow yeah that was That's an awesome shot yeah did you we, get it uh, on did you get it on on video uh not the shot no okay. we got just just about everything was shot because he was it, it was a sensitive uh approach that he was taking so he needed to be by himself to minimize the risk of us spooking or, or you know yeah. blowing his wind cover but uh ended up about he dropped the animal about five miles from the truck took us three out three guys three hours to process it down it ended up being about 245 pounds of debone meat it took wow. us two, day, two days to get it back down the mountain and it was the most it was the <laughs> hardest i've ever had to work for, food, for <laughs> <Yeah>. sure <laughs> We were just we were just worked by the end of that second day down the mountain. Dang, that that's a lot of poundage back and forth, man. Yeah, it was it was memorable for sure. I'll never forget that hunt. Yeah, that's cool. So I'm sure both of you can kind of relate to this next question. Um, where is it? Why use a traditional bow or a long bow and not a modern compound bow? What, what, what are your guys' like story and how you got to uh, uh, making bows and firing bows and how you kind of like chose the, the, the bows that you make currently? Well, for me, it's just uh, more about nostalgia and uh, the connection to, you know, thousands of years of people using the bow and arrow and our ancestry and sort of like the, the romance of the old ways. You know what I mean? It's kind of, it's, it's not a... It's not the same. I hunted with a compound for one year and I had good success with it and it just wasn't for me. I, 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 That's what I, I did too. I personally felt like it wasn't quite challenging enough uh, with the, you know, the aiming aids or the sight aids. And yeah. uh, I just wanted something a little more instinctive. Same thing. I was grouping compound 75 yards, three of them within a mm -hmm. dime. I'm like, well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and I, yeah. I haven't shot one in almost 25, 26 years. Wow. It just, uh, it increases your effectiveness pretty exponentially. And I, mm -hmm. I personally like to, to get really close to animals and, uh, you gotta be, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty impressive shot. If you want to be trying to try to kill animals from further than 30 yards away with a self bow. So you got to get close to animals, ideally within, ideally inside of 20 yards is, is really best mm -hmm. case scenario. So mm -hmm. And just the simplicity it's, of it. It's just a simple, you know, yeah. my bows don't even weigh a pound. I don't even think they weigh nine ounces. That's impressive. <laughs> stick, stick in a string. Yeah. You know? yeah, absolutely. And it takes a lot of practice. It takes dedication. You've got to, yeah. you've got to decide that you're going to be a traditional shooter and you've got to put in the time. I mean, you can take a, you can take a person who's never fired a bow before in their life. Mm -hmm. And in two hours, have them stacking dimes with a compound. But a, a, a traditional bow is gonna, it's gonna take some, some work. You gotta, mm -hmm. you gotta get intimate with your bow. You gotta form a relationship with it and kind of like understand how the seat, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about primitive wood bows here, but like mm -hmm. understands how the seasons are gonna affect your bow, understand how like a really hot or really cold day is gonna affect your shot. So you sort of have to form 
you know, like a friendship or companionship with your bow and, and know it on a deeper level than just this machine that fires arrows that's made of metal and carbon and whatever, you know? Absolutely. I think that's why I started making fiberglass ones. <laughs> I already had a relationship, so I didn't need another one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, the fiberglass bows is definitely going to eliminate a lot of the a lot of the little nuances that you have with, a, yeah, with an all wood bow. Sure. They're going to be m much more resistant to changes in temperature and humidity. Mm -hmm. And yep. So Ray, I had a question for you. If you were to go in that same situation that Corey was in, in the Arctic, very cold and very humid, what kind of uh, bow setup would you bring up there? You're going to hate me, but I don't think I'd take a bow. Okay. I think fishing is your main fishing and snares. Fishing and snares. And if I right and if I found up there that hey, there's big game. I got forty caribou right over the ridge. Hell yeah, I'm gonna build a bow. But you know, everybody's asked me that. I was actually asked to be on a loan or to try out for last spring. Of course, mm -hmm. all this crap happened, you know, and I decided no, that's bad timing. But and uh, everybody's asking me, you know. No, I don't think I'd take a bow. Cause Season nine? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right on, man. I got my, uh, working on my gill nets. You want me to send you one, Corey? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. If you're, if you're weaving them with a needle, they probably look a lot prettier than mine do. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, are you done making your gill net or? No, I haven't even started one. I, I, made a net years ago and just here recently i thought you know i'm gonna make a net this winter so i haven't done it in years so i whittled out a shuttle just to see you know winters are long here yeah how does that um how does that thing work oh we don't have time for that oh, we don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that easy to explain right here yeah no worries another day another show excellent and um, one interesting question I have had over here was um, there was one of our Instagram followers who mentioned uh, your preference between where you knock your arrow, uh, whether it's on your knuckle side or your thumb side. Any kind of like thoughts on, uh, on that? It's really just going to come down to what you prefer, I think. Um... They're two totally different styles. I, I yeah. mean, you can you can definitely shoot off the thumb side with a Mediterranean draw, but a lot of people like to switch to the thumb draw uh, just to, to make the string torque situation a little better. Um, mm -hmm. For me personally, I just I just really like the the regular old Mediterranean draw off the knuckle side, split finger, one finger above, two fingers below. It's just a, a foolproof method for me. I've spent a lot of time with it. I've pretty much dedicated myself to that style. And for me, it's the most, it's the most efficient for me. I, mm -hmm. I've tried other styles and I'm, they're just so clumsy and I, I, I'd rather just stick to what I know. I think, I think no matter which style you're going to choose, I, I, the number one mistake I think a lot of people make is just switching up stuff all the time, switching up their shot cycle all the time, thinking that they're shooting mm -hmm. bad because you know of some little nuance that they've got to change. So every week or every couple of days, they're putting in some new, you know, yeah. some new piece of the equation. Just pick a style, learn your fundamentals, no matter what that style is, just learn the fundamentals and spend time with it. Do, do the work and put arrows down range and you'll, you'll get good with the bow. You got to give your brain time to like map the neural pathways to the target with your chosen style. So if you're always oh, yeah. switching stuff, you, you yeah. just, you're never going to catch up. Yep. And uh, Ray, I think we, we have a question here for you. How long is your beard? And would you grow it much longer before you went on a loan? I don't know. I just, <laughs> <laughs> it's not very long. <laughs> it's, it looks about, it's about Viking long, I think. There yeah. You go. <laughs> I don't think I can ever get, get there. Maybe with like a wig over here or something. <laughs> But you, you were mentioning uh, kind of your approach uh, to shooting. If you were to kind of um, describe how you shoot to someone who's picking up a traditional longbow, how would you describe that process? I'm purely instinct now. Is that what she's wanting to know? Yeah. So okay. how, do, how do you coach someone through or introduce the idea of instinctive shooting? 
Well, at first, you know, everybody starts out gap shooting, no matter they do it subconsciously or consciously. You're got you're judging the distance of your target with the tip of your arrow. That's just how people are. And then eventually over the years, you can just grip it and rip it. You know, it just, you don't have time to gap shoot. Like I, you know, I bow fish all the time. You don't have time to gap shoot, you know, when they're coming in real quick, you're just thwack or aerial targets or whatever. There's not a, I don't know if I could really coach anybody to gap or, you know, uh, instinctive shooting. I mm-hmm. think it's just something you work on yourself and it comes to you finally. Uh, Jeff Cavanaugh, he used to make awesome videos. I wish he still would. I keep trying to get him to make more videos. But if you go back and look at Jeff Cavanaugh's old videos on YouTube, he's got some great tutorials on uh, shooting styles. And he'll he'll walk you through uh, gap shooting and instinctive shooting, your form. Right on. Great, great guy to watch as far as that. And Jeff, you need to make some videos. I bet he's watching this right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jeff's videos are good. I've, I've learned a lot yeah. from those. They were some of the yeah. first videos Great I discovered guy, on too. shooting for him. Yeah, me too. But uh, I'm kind of like Ray. I'm just uh, nowadays. I'm just a grip and rip it. But uh, like I was saying, I think people should spend some time on the fundamentals, which is basically yeah. just pick which side of the bow you're going to shoot off of. Learn how to set up a proper anchor point. Mm-hmm. Uh, the anchor point is where your your string hand, you know, touches on your face to give you a point of reference. It can be the middle finger to the corner of the mouth. It can be the middle finger to the ear or the thumb to the ear. So learn the fundamentals of your anchor point. Learn about keep it the same. (laughs) Yeah, always the same. Mm -hmm. The anchor point is essentially your rear sight. Your bow arm is your, or actually I kind of think that the eyes are one aiming system and then the anchor point is the next aiming system. Yeah. Because you're not going to be thinking about your bow arm and instinctive shooting. You're just going to let repetition take over. But uh, mm-hmm. learn the basics of full expansion. I always tell people, like, because I think a lot of people get very confused with back tension, which is, you know, squeezing mm-hmm. the shoulder blades together for, for the full alignment of the body. But I kind of tell people, instead of contracting the back, just focus on expanding the heart or expanding the chest. That's kind of something I read in some, some old archery books uh, from mm-hmm. the ancient Arabic times. But... Uh, they talk about building full expansion with a chest. So a nice big deep breath right before your shot will just like bring your body up and fill your chest cavity full of air. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's just uh, stare at that target with everything that I've got because the eyes are going to be your main sighting system. Yeah. I take a focus big, on your target yep. and pick the smallest spot you possibly can, you know, pick a, if you're shooting at a deer, you don't shoot at the deer. You shoot at a tiny little tuft of misplaced fur or a dark spot on the animal that, uh, you know, yep. you can pick out in the in the bread basket area or mm-hmm. uh, if you're shooting on the target, don't shoot at the target. Don't shoot at even the yellow rings. Shoot it like an old arrow shaft hole in the exact area yep. that you want to hit. One thing I used to do with new students learning how to uh, shoot is put a, just a black bag over a bot or your target and just say, shoot it. There's nothing to shoot at. It's just black and they hit. I said, now chase that arrow. And soon they figure out on their own where those two connect and that mm-hmm. that truly that probably does help instinct shooting really fast and a lot of times uh, new shooters have a really problem with left to right and a good way of doing that is just dropping a string down the face of the target and I used to do that with students too I don't care where you hit on the target just hit the string whether it's up or down and that'll start really focusing in mm-hmm. and that's a really good way to you know, like he said, don't shoot at the target, target face, find something to shoot at. Like Byron Ferguson used to say, the center of a beach ball is the same size as the center of an aspirin. You want yep. that center. So it's all, all amazing information, guys. Thank you so much uh, for giving us uh, a little more wisdom from your uh, many years of both hunting and also uh, boy, uh, bow making. We have uh, maybe one last question over here. Um, how do you recommend drying a bow in a primitive uh, situation? Ray, you mentioned um, putting it in a sand in a shaded area. Um, is there anything else that you guys uh, come across? With? Does it say how do you shave the belly and tiller the bow without a yeah. block plane? Yeah. So I've never used a block plane on on a bow ever before. Um, no. 
recommended drying in a primitive survival situation. We kind of touched on that earlier. Uh, you're going to, like Ray said, don't touch it for a couple days. Get that bark stripped off. Don't touch it for a few days. Let it dry out enough you can get pencil marks on it or ash marks on it for your profile. Yep. Get that profile roughed out. That'll take you the better part of the day. And then uh, start force drying it over some hot coals or the flames of the fire. And just very gently and slowly moving it back and forth over the flames until it's too hot to touch. And uh, doing that doing that over the course of a couple days, just heating and cooling and heating and cooling over the hot coals. And uh, mm -hmm. you're never get, you're never in a survival situation going to know when it's perfectly dry. Mm -hmm. So you just got to you just got to get it good and be dry. Till, yeah, just keep it out of the dry. <laughs> yep, until your fingernail won't dent it anymore. And mm -hmm. then get it a little drier than that, and then yep. uh, g give it a shot. And if it's if it's starting to take a whole bunch of string follow, which is what we talked about earlier, where the bow stays bent after it's unstrung, mm -hmm. if if you start crafting the bow and you notice that it's really early on when you've barely started uh, stressing the bow, if it's already taken on a whole bunch of string follow, you're not nearly dry enough. So you need to spend yeah. some more time over the coals. And you can you can hear it too if you tap on it. You know, while it's green, it's that wet funk 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 sound. And when it starts seasoning out and gets harder and harder, it starts getting a little higher pitched, you know, denser sound, a ting, ting, ting. That's kind yeah. of a good way to tell the density difference right as on. far as it right. curing and hardening. But, and yeah. um, uh, William asked uh, kind of a follow-up question. He said, what about building a smoker? Is that a thing that you do for bows? That's after you shoot the deer. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I, I know a lot of uh, a lot of the ancient cultures would smoke their bows overnight uh, when they'd go to sleep. They put them up in the top of their shelters and just let them smoke. That keeps them good and dry. Uh, it also makes a, a really beautiful patina on the bow. It really darkens it up and makes it more camouflaged. So that was one thing I did when I was on alone. Is any time I was in a shelter, I had the bow stashed up in the roof, collecting all the smoke from the fire, and uh, kept it real dry. Gave it a beautiful patina. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be uh, smoking your bow at night and the top of your shelter is going to be a great yeah, long-term moisture management situation, like uh, solution. And they say the suet actually kind of waterproofs it too or makes it more water repellent. Than Interesting. I don't know. I guess nice. it'd be like smoking buckskins. Maybe yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Makes sense. Water repellent. Right on. Well, guys, I want to respect uh, both of your times. I know both of you are very busy. So uh, as we kind of wrap this up, um, Ray and Corey, can you give us like um, kind of like a, a one liner of things that you're passionate about, what you uh, want to promote on this channel? You know what? I just encourage people, if you're interested in archery, give the traditional route a try. They don't uh, you don't have to go straight for the compounds or, or maybe, you know, you try out the compounds and uh, and you find early early success or a lot of ease in that. Give the traditional a try. The fun factor is just I, I, it's hard to describe. It's it's a lot of fun to shoot a bow with no sights and to uh, to put in the work and uh, and hit exactly what you're looking at. There's no feeling like it. Then when you just oh, yeah. look at then when you look at a target from far away and you have no sight and you just let your body and your instinct take over and you just nail grip, it. grip and rip that arrow and hit exactly where you're looking. There's no feeling like it. So give traditional a try. Right on. Yep. And for those of you uh, who want to follow Corey, uh, he is on Instagram at organic underscore Archer and his website's at www.organicarchery.com. So give him a follow and check out his website as well. Um, do you still have any bows left for this season? Or are they all sold? I I have not had a bow for sale. I think I may, may might have only had one or two bows for sale in the last two years that were not related to the, my wait list. So, uh, for anybody that's curious, I normally work on a wait list. Um, the the wait's real reasonable right now. It's about ten to twelve weeks to your door. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the best way to get a hold of one is just jump on my website, click on the contact, or kind of explore the website a little bit, figure out what you want. There's a lot of information about the different bow woods in there and uh, how the ordering process works and then jump on my contact page and shoot me a custom order form. Right on. Because that I have no idea if I'll ever have a <laughs> stock again. <laughs> For real. And uh, Ray, why don't you uh, sign us out? Well, I just say uh, everybody get outside and try something new, you know, get out there and piddle and whittle. 
Absolutely. And uh, Ray has uh, an Instagram and uh, YouTube channel on Instagram at Riverbend Longbows. And then on YouTube, you can go to Riverbend Longbows Outdoors. He, you produce content like very regularly that uh, I've noticed, like almost weekly. Is that right? I do. Awesome. Awesome. And um, you also have uh, a website in the works and uh, you sell longbows. I believe uh, yep. what uh, I saw previously is your bows might be on stock and um, uh, being sold through Zach F Fowler. Is that right? Uh, possibly. We need to talk possibly. about it more, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yep. I look forward to learning more uh, from, from you both. And I'm going to try to take what you taught us make my first self bow and uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you guys for your time and um, thank you for sharing your knowledge. Yeah. Thanks you a ton for having, thank us, you. having us on. It's been fun. Yeah. All right. Take care guys. See ya. See you later.